from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. I need to mention everybody here. Or just yes, everyone. Yeah, good idea too. You no, it's right Noah down, and Gordon. John Bishop. Uh huh. Okay. And Anita Diaz. All right. All right. We're rolling. We are rolling. It is Monday, May thirteenth, two thousand thirteen. We are in the home of William F. Russell uh, here before Esquire. You. Esquire, uh, <laughs> doing an interview for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, my name's Taylor Branch. It's Bill Russell. The videographer is John Bishop, um, assisted by Noah Bishop. And from the museum, we have uh, Elaine Nichols, and we have Mr. Russell's longtime uh, assistant and friend, Anita Diaz. And uh, we are here to record an interview for posterity and this, um, and this museum about Mr. Russell's life and views. And uh, this is the most formal part of this interview, and we hope to just uh, have a good time talking uh, about the career of a, of a legendary figure in American sports and in American life. Did you say posteria? Post <laughs> <laughs> So, we're off to <laughs> so let me ask you the first question. Where do you remember getting the extraordinary laugh, which is one of the first things that people ask me about when they say that I, when they find out that I know you, is where did his laugh come from? My mother, she told me never to hold back on anything. If I have to sneeze, sneeze. If you have to laugh, laugh. Don't hold it back. She says, good for your health. Oh, that's good. Well, you followed that ad ad advice. When we were working years ago, um, we, Bill and I have a history of doing a book together uh, about his life. We talked an awful lot about your mother. She died long before then. I never met her. But I, I didn't know your father, Mr. Charlie. Um, and it seemed to me in discussing and getting to know you that an awful lot of your character uh, comes from those family people. I think the first thing, the most memorable line you ever spoke to me was that you thought your character was formed by the fact that you never had a doubt that both of your parents loved you. Is that is that correct? That's the first thing I can remember as a person. Is that, uh, you know, you a baby, then the world opens up to you. Well, I always had the confidence that my mother and father loved me, and uh, and what they taught me was, <clears throat> is that uh, if they loved me, I must be okay. So if other people encounter me and they have a problem with me, my father said, that's their little red wagon. And so uh, I've never, uh, worked to be liked because that would be hypocritical to me if I wanted to do things to make somebody like me. What is it worth? A little background. You grew up in Louisiana, uh, born in 1934 in Monroe, Louisiana. Um, the uh, second son of Katie and, and Mr. Charlie Russell. Uh, the other figure that we talked about a lot in your childhood was your grandfather. Well, both your grandfathers, but primarily Grandfather Russell, who you yeah. call the old man. Yes. Uh, he was an extraordinary. Uh, one time in Louisiana, the uh, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan had this black guy out in the woods beating him, and you could hear him screaming and crying for mercy, at least a mile away. So my grandfather heard that, he went and got his shotgun and loaded it with bird seed, and went out and shot into the crowd about a half a dozen times, and it dispersed the crowd, and he never went to see if the guy just left. 
and he's talking about old Doc something or other. So he's picking out bird seed for a week. <laughs> and uh, when my father was born, my grandfather realized in that part of Louisiana, there was no school for the black children. So he decided, he got to talk to some other guys, and they got together enough money, and they went to the lumber yard and they bought some lumber. And they bargained and negotiated and got to pay for the lumber, and went and got the wagon and the mules to take the lumber to the site, they were gonna build a schoolhouse. So when they got back to the lumber yard to pick up the lumber, <clears throat> the guy at the lumber yard said, what you boys gonna do with all this lumber? Well, one of them in the crowd said, we're gonna build a schoolhouse for the kids. He said, they don't need to know how to read to pick cotton. In fact, I'm not gonna let you do anything like that. I'm not gonna sell you the lumber. So my grandfather says, okay, well just give my money back. He said, no, I'm not gonna do that either. There's no agreement that a white man has to respect with a bunch of black boys. So my grandfather said, uh, let me get this straight. <clears throat> You're not gonna give us a lumber and you're not gonna give us the money back. Well, the third opinion, option is I'll have to kill you. I went to get a shotgun. <laughs> and so the guy in the lumber yard said, well, you know, you got to have that lumber. <laughs> and so they built the schoolhouse and they got together $53 to hire a teacher for a year to teach at this school they just built. And uh, that was the kind of stuff where he says, you know, he, he says you didn't take nothing off of nobody. And uh, along that line, my grandfather never spent went to school on one single day. <clears throat> My father went to the sixth grade that he dropped out. I did four years at the University of San Francisco. And my youngest child, my daughter, graduated from Harvard Law School. So that's the evolution of the family from my grandfather to my kids, from law school to Harvard Law School. But at the time you were born in 1934, your mother already, even though your father had practically no schooling and your grandfather had none, she admired, it, she valued education so much, she named your, your middle name as Felton after the president of, uh, I think, Southern University at the yes. time, is that right? his name was Felton Clark. And so she gave me Felton to send me a path that I was thinking about going to college. In fact, uh, my mother died of kidney failure, okay? And she was in the hospital sick, and she knew she was dying. So she called my father and said, I want you to promise me something, that you'll send my boys to college. And my father said, uh, he promised. So when she died, we took her <clears throat> to Louisiana to be buried, and uh, while I was there, she had five sisters. And they were debating who's gonna take me and who's gonna take my brother. And he says, that debate is uh, no value. I'm gonna take them back to California and raise them myself. They says, no man can raise kids. He says, well, I, gotta, I promised their mother I would try. So he sold his business and went to work in a foundry for less a week that had been making a day. And uh, and the reason he did that is because he wanted to he had to be time home. at home. Yes, he had to be home every night. He said, you can't let kids raise themselves. And so, uh, and I understood that. And I appreciated that 
uh, I just, I loved him, you know. Uh, he was like his 75th birthday. <clears throat> and we were talking and I said, you know, I love you. He says, well, I love you too. That was the first time he'd ever said that. But I knew it. Yeah. I think you said at one time that that when he took you and your brother back to Oakland on the train. You went back on the train, right? Right. From your mother's funeral. This yeah. is in 1946. You're 12. Yeah. Right. It's very, very unusual that a single father, a widow, widower, would raise his two boys. And he, he said he talked, I think you said you, he talked to you the whole way back about how you were going to live without your mother. Yes. Uh, he said you had a tremendous loss. But you got to live the way she wanted you to live. And uh, she wanted you to be educated. And uh, I don't know much about it, but I'll help you whenever I can. <laughs> and he said you're going to cook and clean and... Well, we had a setup where uh, the week that I cooked, my brother washed the dishes. And then the next week he'd cook and I'd wash the dishes. And uh, there was no gourmet cooks in that house. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember even earlier at one point you said that down in Louisiana, Mr. Charlie would come home from work sometimes and the whole family would go out to play and he would carry all of you? Yes, well, he was a big, strong guy, okay? 6'3", 220 pounds. And we had this huge field with tall grass, like uh, right in front of the house. And we'd go play hide and seek in the tall grass. Well, to get to our starting point, he put my brother on one arm, me on the other arm, and my mother on his back, and run full speed across that field. And I thought he was so such a superman. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, he was uh, a lot of things that he'd always, when I was playing for the Celtics, and uh, I was up in Cutches in the Catskills, and Red Auerbach and I were talking, and one of the uh, waiters came and said, you hear what happened to Wilt? And I said, no, what, did you get a car wreck or something? Cause he used to drive fast. And uh, he says, no, he just signed a contract for $100,000 a year. That's the first time any NBA player had reached that plateau. In fact, I think Mickey Mantle, uh, Joe DiMaggio, and uh, I think Willie Mays were the only pro athletes making $100,000. So I says to Red, well, I know what I want. He says, what's that? I says, 100000 and one dollar. Because I just won the MVP in this league, okay? <laughs> so he says, okay. So I go back to my room, I call my father up, and I says, Dad, you won't believe this. They're going to pay me $100,000 a year to do this. Tell you the reason I called, just tell you now, <clears throat> you don't have to work anymore. I'll make enough that I can take care of the rest of the way. He says, I don't want your damn money. I got my own money. I, I says, but that job you got is terrible. He's working in a foundry. He says, listen, I give these people 35 of the best years of my life. Now, I'm gonna give them a few of the bad ones. <laughs> that sounds like Mr. Charlie. <laughs> I'd like to back up just a little bit for when you left Monroe, Louisiana, because as I understand it, at any rate, your family was part of what we now understand as the Great Migration, or at least the World, yes. War, World War II yes. Migration. Um, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book about it, Isabel Wilkerson, The right. Warmth of Other Sons. And I met that lady. She's, she's a wonderful uh, writer. 
and, and anyway, he left before you before your mother's funeral. Um, he left Louisiana, could you and and migrated first to Detroit and then out to Oakland. Right. What could you tell us exactly how that happened and why it happened? Well, uh, he first he's working at his bag factory, and he asked for a raise. And the boss says, I can't give you a raise, Charlie. If I give you a raise, you'll be making as much as some of the white fellas, and I can't pay more you owe as much as I pay the white guys. And he used the N-word to my father. Mm -hmm. Just like it was nothing. And so my father was at home that night, and he was talking out loud. He says, you know, I'm going to have to leave here. Because if I stay here, who will raise my kids? And they said, well, you can raise them. He said, no, if I stay here, either I'll kill one of them or one of them will kill me. And either way, there'll be nobody to raise my kids. So we started working on uh, going to Detroit. And the Ford Motor Company was hiring anybody that showed up on the in a wartime. This is during World War II. Yes. <clears throat> so we made arrangements to go to Detroit. Well, Saturday at noontime was payday at the factory. And I, he says to the boss, oh, well, this is my last day. What do you mean? Well, no, I'm not coming back. This is it. That's after he got the check. Uh, <laughs> so the guy says, Charlie, if you worry about that race, I'll tell you what. You just book, log in two more hours, and that'll be your race. You don't have to do the work. Just log in. And my father said, no, uh, this is it. See, the guy thought he was upset about the race, but he's upset about the boss saying the N-word to him to his face. Right. And so... Uh, and that wasn't the only incident like that. Right. He had. He had that kind of stuff happened all the time. At the, I remember you told one about at a gas station once where the yes. guy just pumped other people's gas and well, left him sitting there. Well, well, my father thought that he was being totally disrespected all the time. Mm -hmm. So when he told the guy he was leaving, at noontime, at 6 o'clock the same day, he got a train to Little Rock, okay? Headed for Detroit. That was Saturday. Monday morning, this guy shows up at our house looking for him. He was from the draft board. And you're gonna tell my father if he didn't come back to work, he's gonna be drafted into the army. But he was not eligible because he had a wife and two kids. And they weren't drafting those guys lately, but they didn't even care about that. So uh, I think my father only went back when we went to my mother's children. Okay, can we pause for just a second? We're rolling again. All right, Bill, let's um, pick up again with the, the, the move out of Louisiana. The re your, your father decided he couldn't stay there. This is right at the beginning of World War II, and he moved first to Detroit, and then from there to uh, Oakland, and he sent for the family from Oakland. Is that right? How did yeah. that occur? Well, if you've ever been to Detroit in the wintertime, <laughs> <laughs> he said that was killing. It was too cold. So he moved to Oakland, California, and went to work in uh, shipyards. And uh, he worked in shipyards until the war was over. And then uh, they closed the shipyards. They did every, they stopped everything. So he got an idea. He bought himself a truck and started going out to the, the valley, which was 45 an hour away, and started talking to the farmers about getting fruit pickers. And uh, he made quite a business out of it. And so, 
from the time I was, after we went back from my mother's funeral until I got to college, I always bought my school clothes picking fruit. And uh, I was so proud of how much money I could make. It wasn't any money, but it was some money, whatever I could make. And so uh, I, uh, then I enrolled in the university. Yeah, you know what's really funny about that? When I was in Louisiana, my mother kept me away from white people as much as she could. And she kept white people away from me. Because she said, you don't know what they'll do. Okay? And so, uh, when I first went to California, I went to school with some white kids. But then by the time I got to high school, it was an all black school, except for the faculty. And then I went to university, and there were nine black kids on the campus of the whole student body. And so I was back into that. And uh, you might say cultural shock. <laughs> but I had a pretty good career. And uh, I was self-taught how to play. And the reason I say that is I got cut from the junior varsity in 11th grade. And so uh, while I was absorbing this, the varsity coach, who had been my homeroom teacher in junior high school, says to me, I'm glad you got cut. Why are you glad? He says, because today you can come out for the varsity. I said, I just got cut from junior varsity. He says, you're not, I'm not a junior varsity coach, I'm the varsity coach. So I'm on the varsity. And uh, he says, I want you to wait after practice, the first practice. I said, what is, what, what? He says, let's go. He took, got his car and drove us to the boys club. <laughs> and then he took uh, two dollars out of his pocket and bought me a year's membership. He said, I want you, after practice here, I want you to go to the boys club and play basketball every day. And so that's what I did. And that's where I learned to play. And so uh, I had the good fortune of not being influenced by a coach. <laughs> And so, uh, could you hold up for a second? Sure. Personally, all the cliche things that a college basketball player does, I didn't do any of them. So they figured I couldn't play. So they're, during my whole freshman year, they considered that a waste of a scholarship. And so my sophomore year, they did not renew my scholarship. But the coach, uh, I guess feeling guilty, he went to the dean of College of Business Administration and found an unused scholarship. So I played my sophomore year on an academic scholarship. And, uh, and so my career, my sophomore year, there were a couple of things that uh, made it interesting. Uh, four of the top six players on the varsity my sophomore year <clears throat> told the coach that they did, did not appreciate him making them have to play with black guys. Now, he never told me that until I had retired from the Celtics. But I know I didn't get along with these guys. And, uh, and a lot of things happened. 
I just said this is part of life. And uh, my first varsity game set the tone of my relationship with the coach. We played Cal Berkeley. And uh, the center was a preseason All-American. The game starts, and the first five shot he took, five shots he took, I blocked. And nobody in the building had ever seen anything like that. So they called timeout to discuss it, what it was I was doing, because they didn't know what I was doing. <clears throat> so we get in our huddle, and my coach says, you can't play defense like that. What? I just stopped him five times in a row. That's not the way to play defense. So uh, he showed me on the sidelines there how he wanted me to play defense. So I go back out and I try it, and the guy shoots layups three times in a row. And I said, this does not make sense. So I went back to playing the way I knew how. He was really insulted by that. He was trying to help me, and I was hard-headed and stubborn and didn't know what I was doing, and he was trying to help me to figure out what I was doing, and I re rejected. So he never liked me as a player from then on. We're talking about the beginning of your basketball career at the University of San Francisco. Right. 52 to 56. Basketball was taught differently then. I mean, some of the things that people now wouldn't be familiar with is that you weren't supposed to leave your feet. And, yeah, uh, no, defense, no good defensive player ever leaves his feet. Right. Well, basically what I was doing, in retrospect, was bringing the vertical game to a game that had been horizontal. And this is all again a new element. See, in high jump, which I participated in track and field, I could jump over my head. Well, uh, in basketball in the gym, we should do an exercise where we take chalk and put it on your finger and run and jump as high and, and put a chalk mark. Well, I can put a chalk mark 13 feet above the, fl the floor, which is the, height, the top of the backboard. And uh, that was going to waste. So uh, for three years, this coach did not like me. But uh, I made up my mind that I was going to see how good I could be. So I really worked at developing the game. and. Uh, Part of my game was logistics. And uh, so I learned to how to cover great distances in a short period of time. And so uh, I developed how to play. Well, he never agreed with that. Although, my junior and senior year, we won 55 straight games, which is not bad. It was a record at the time, and we also won back-to-back -back Final Fours. And <clears throat> I set a record that still stands today in 2013. I had 27 rebounds in the championship game. And that's still a record. And I had 50 rebounds in the two games, the semifinals and the finals, which is still a record. But uh, my coach uh, was kind of a purist. This is the way the game is supposed to be played. And I, I wasn't doing that. Some of this you uh, um, once said that even before you got to the University of San Francisco that 
that a lot of your um, skills in basketball c came from um, mental games that you did yes. from from drawing uh, you had drawn out of a library and that imagining things in art uh, on a, on a trip into well, the northwest at the, at the uh, at that time I had the ability to use my imagination and so uh, I went on this trip with these really first class basketball players and I watched him do everything and I watched the total person, the footwork, head fakes, whatever, dribbling, the whole thing. And the next day, like a shoot around, I would try to do these things. And so, uh, as I told one of the guys in Oakland, he says, what about San Francisco? I said, well, the best way to explain it is I was already where I was going to be when I got there. You know, and uh, I, I told you about when we first moved into the projects and uh, my mother was getting their, the apartment together and I was sitting down the steps, stayed out of the way, and these five guys ran by. And one of them slept as he went by. Well, I was nine years old, and I did what nine-year-olds are supposed to do. I went and told my mother. <laughs> and she said, what? She grabbed the keys to the house and grabbed me, and we went all through the projects looking for those five guys. And so she says, are these the guys? I said, yes, ma'am. I didn't know what she was going to do. I thought she was going to take care of me. But the way she took care of me was, okay, you're going to fight every one of them. All five of them, one at a time. Thanks, Ma. <laughs> 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 so I go into five fights, and I lose three and win two. And so we go back to our place, and I'm crying. And she says, don't cry. You did what you're supposed to do. Doesn't matter whether you won or lost. The matter is you stood up for yourself. And that's what you must always do. Stand up for yourself. And so that day changed my whole attitude about it. she says, I don't want you to ever, ever pick a fight. But always finish the fight that you're in. And so, and so that's the kind of stuff I got from my mother. My father, they all, the, the roles almost reversed. She told me to be a tough fighter, and he told me to be philosophical. <laughs> well, he was philosophical. Yes, he was. You know, Greg Taylor, I'll tell you how my father was. He would never take anything from me. I was making a lot of money. He would never take anything. He says his attitude was, I got my own money. I don't need yours. So uh, for his birthday one year, I went to a local automobile dealer and bought a car and told the salesman, I want you to take this car and deliver it to this address. And don't say anything. Just when the, guy, the man comes to the door, have the keys and say, that's your car, and leave. No explanation. So I called him up and I said, did you get your car? He said, yes. I, I just can't believe anybody do something that nice to, for me. I said, well, uh, it's okay. So a week later, he says, he calls me up. I said, okay, how you doing? He said, I ought to kick your ass. What? What did I do? He says, I just got my first speeding ticket. <laughs> at, at San Francisco, I think you once said 1956 was a pretty amazing year in sports. That's your senior year. 
and you were not only in the NCAA Final Four for the second year in a row winning it, but you also went to the Olympics and straight into the NBA. Right. Well, uh, we won the Final Four. Who'd you, who did you beat? Do you remember? Oh, uh, yeah, we beat Iowa. Nice bunch of men, too. You know, you play against guys, and the guys at Iowa were first-class bunch of guys. You know, in fact, I, for years I kept up with them uh, at, long after we played against each other. Hmm. Uh, uh, in fact, my counterpart, Bill Logan, who's a center, was the head of the Iowa Bankers Association. Years later, I went and speak to one of their conventions. Well, anyway, uh, I was on the Olympic team. And uh, in the gold medal game, we beat the Soviet Union by 35 points. <laughs> we, were, we were kind of mean guys. See, we were, in the tournament, we played a team from Thailand, okay? Their center was 5'10". And so you would say, well, these guys on competition, let's just walk through it. No. Let's find out how bad we can beat these guys. We were going to try to beat them by 100 points. I don't think we got maybe to 80, 85. <laughs> but uh, I had a lot of fun. So after the Olympics, I went home, got married, and then went to Boston. And uh, I, had, I had not talked to the Celtics before that. I was really an amateur. And uh, I got there, and we we had an idea of what what it was going to be. It took about half an hour to work that out, and uh, and so it is thirteen months. The final four, the Olympic gold, and my rookie year, we won the NBA. So we were in the college championship, the world amateur championships, and the professional championship in thirteen months. And uh, that's a pretty good run. Is it true that um, when you went to Boston that, that Walter Brown, the owner of the Celtics, and Red Auerbach and Bill Sharman met you at the airport? Well, uh, I think Red was on the road. Oh. But Bill Sharman, no, it was all three of them, you're right. Uh, Red, Walter Brown, and... Uh, Bill Sharman. Bill Sharman. Now, Walter Brown was one of the most... Marvelous people I've ever encountered. The owner of the Celtics? Yes. Uh, see, there were things that the Celtics did that uh, I don't think are common knowledge. The first black player drafted in the NBA was a guy named Chuck Cooper from Duquesne. The Celtics drafted him. And at the draft, uh, one of the other owners said to Walter Brown, you know he's colored. And Walter Brown said, I don't care if he's polka dot. That's who we drafted. Okay, fast forward. Celtics were the first NBA team to start five black guys. It was an accident. And uh, I'll show you how the Celtics were. We had been doing it for over a week and didn't know it until we read about it in the paper. <laughs> See, Tommy Hudson was uh, one of the forwards and he got injured. And so his substitute went in and filled in until Hudson got back. And so he had five black guys start. And uh, like I said, we didn't know about it until we read the paper, because this was the five, these are guys in our rotation, you know? And so, so now you got first black guy signed, the first 
five black guys started. We had a guy named Sam Jones from North Carolina College, one of the, quote, traditional Negro colleges. Well, we drafted Sam in the first round. That was the first time in any sport that a guy from one of the Negro colleges was drafted in the first round. You see, the difference is, if you draft in the first round, you're on the team, you have to play your way off. If you drafted in the second round, you got to make the team. And so your compensation is different. <laughs> so Sam uh, was our first pick. And turned out to be a great, great pick. Uh, and then uh, the Celtics were the first team to hire a black coach. You? Yeah. <laughs> and the way that happened was our back says to me, I'm retiring. And I'll have to pick the next coach. And I will not hire anybody that you do not approve of 100%. So he says, what we're going to do is we're going to make, you make a list and I'll make a list of five guys that'd be okay with you and I'll have five guys okay with me. And whoever's on both lists is that who'll get the job. Well, there was nobody on both lists. And so, uh, Red says, well, I'm going to hire this one guy. I says, Brad, if you hire him, I will retire with you. What's the matter? Don't you think he's a good coach? I said, it'll make a difference. I don't even want to be in the same room with him. <laughs> so he said, well, what am I going to do? Well, going back, he had offered me the job first. And I said, Red, I watched the stuff you went through. No way. And so he said, well, what am I going to do? I said, okay, I'll take it. I said, here's the deal, though, Red. I'll take the job. If it doesn't work, we'll know after half by the All-Star game. And if we agree it's not working, you can hire anybody you want, and I guarantee you to give them 100% cooperation. But we never got to that. So that was the deal. Yes. That's 1966, right? You're the first yes. black player. Not only a coach, but a player coach. What is that? Had there been other player coaches in the NBA? I don't know. Uh-huh. You know, I, you know I, no assistant coaches. I mean, people today must be shocked. There are so many, I don't know how many assistant coaches there are. Well, Red says, do you want an assistant? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, okay, Red, give me one of your assistants. Well, Red had never had an assistant, okay? So I asked him, why don't you have an assistant? He said, that's just another guy you have to coach. <laughs> and uh, I, the atmosphere in Boston would have been detrimental to the situation, I thought, if I had an assistant coach. Because uh, half a season into it, they said, well, that guy's doing all the coaching. Russell's just a figurehead, no matter what. Well, if I was going to coach, I wanted to be the coach, okay? And so uh, that's where I was doing it. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, Red's last year as a coach, he got thrown out of 22 games, including the All-Star game. <laughs> <laughs> and so as a captain, I had to take the rest of the game. So I, I went in with some experience on how to do it. And we had, uh, as a captain, 
We used to play gin rummy at night after games because neither one of us could sleep after a game. And we talk about coaching philosophy and uh, what he wanted to do was set up a system, make sure that everybody knows it, and then get the hell out the way. And that was the way he coached. And that's the way he got the team together. Because he used to do, I trusted him completely. And he used to do some things that I'd asked him about. For example, you know, I played for Boston for 13 seasons. And during that 13 seasons, we only made one trade. And uh, we picked some guys up after they retired and we'd give them another year. But he never said to anybody, the way you played there, you got to play different here. I got you here because of the way you played there. So I don't want you to change. That's the way I want you to play. And so uh, guys did not have to, quote, to play for something, did not have to learn a new way of playing. He got you there for where you were before you got here. And he had a place for you in that system. Why did he get thrown out of so many games? Oh, we're back. Why did Red Auerbach get thrown out of so many games? Did it serve a purpose or was it just his personality? A combination. Uh, he was never going to sit on the sideline and say, what the heck? He says, my team, I can't get my team to fight for me if I won't fight for them. In fact, my first game, referee called goal attending, which was not goal attending. Red went nuts. He got to yell and scream and stomped until the referee called a tentacle on him. And, uh, but, they were careful after that when they called goaltending. That was his purpose. And after the game, I said to Red, uh, you know, the, you're the first coach since high school that looked out for me. He says, I can't expect my players to fight for me if I won't fight for them. That's just the way I coach. It wasn't you. <laughs> Thanks, Red. <laughs> 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 Could you talk a little bit? You played on sto storied Celtic teams. You won 11 championships in 13 years. Just a little bit of personality sketches of the various players on the team, like Sam Jones and, you know, what they were like. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, first of all, more important to me than win 11 championships, we won eight in a row. That is difficult. You know, of course, you got to do the same things without repeating yourself, which takes some planning. Uh, well, I played with some guys that were, we had a family. Uh, I liked all the guys except for two, and they will never know who they were. You know, uh, uh, and these two I was ambivalent about, you know. Uh, Bill Sharman, uh, most thoughtful player I ever played with. Uh, he did everything by the numbers and would fight at the drop of a hat, and was always throwing some brothers around, some brayros around. <laughs> I think Shelby led the, led the league in fights. <laughs> uh, Kuzi could not fight, okay? So one of the things Red did uh, was very interesting. We used to play at Syracuse, and their guards used to beat up Kuzi. Just beat him up. Okay, that's a foul. 
but we're going to be, still beat him up. So Red got so incensed about that. So one night he says, okay, we had a guy named Jungle Jim Luskatov. Big, look like he'd been lifting weights and all that. He says, Lusky, listen, I want you to watch. The first guy hits Kuzi, I want you to turn around and knock the hell out of Dolph Shays. Shays was their best player and he played forward. So over here, this guy hits Kuzi, whack! And Shays is saying, what the hell is going on? <laughs> why'd, you, why'd you hit me? You know? In fact, the next time we played there, all the fans had uh, cardboard hatchets. And said, Luskatov was a hatchet man. But what they had noticed was, uh, every time the guy hit Kuzi, that was a clue for Luskatov to hit Chase. And so they figured out that maybe we shouldn't be beating up on Kuz, you know. And so uh, Red always had a purpose for everything he does, did, you know. And uh, Kuzi was the star of the Celtics when you arrived. Yes. Right? How did the two of you get along? Perfect. Uh, there was never any negative exchange between the two of us. In fact, uh, I took the attitude, I don't know if it was proper, but Coos was not a stalwart on defense, okay? <laughs> How's that? Is that, is that <laughs> okay. Gentle. Yeah, okay. But I never complained to him or to anybody. I looked at the situation, and I talked to Kuzi about it. And I said, well, when this guy comes up and you guard him, make him go left if he's right-handed. And as soon as he gets past you, run to the center. So I don't want him to be able to throw a bounce pass to the center because he, he can't throw it over the top because I won't let him. Okay? So now, Kuz introduced a lot, intercepted a lot of passes because they tried to throw a bounce pass and he was in the lane. And so, I used to lead the league way, way lead in block shots. Well, the great majority of them were all Kuzi's men. And we turned that, and then he and I would, would talk, and uh, one day he says to me, you know, uh, on the rebounds and block shots, you come on the ball, you're looking for me. When the shot's taken, I'll run over to this spot over here. It's halfway between the free throw line and the half court on the left side. And so if we're on the road, I'd look for the green. Then out of the corner of my eye, I didn't have to turn around and look. I could catch the ball, catch the rebound, and just change direction. He would take two dribbles and then we'd have a layup. And so uh, I felt, see, my whole thing was I found out that in order to get any recognition, I would have to change my complexion. <laughs> and so what I, what I decided to do, and I was in college also, tried to win every game. And so when my career's over, they said, so-and-so's better, he's better, he's better. In fact, my second year in the league, the players, in those days, we had to vote for the MVP. You could not vote for your own team, but you could vote for anybody you wanted. Well, I was overwhelmingly MVP. It wasn't even close. The writers, or the media, whatever you call it, picked me second team all league. 
So I think I'm still the only guy that ever won an MVP, every second team all league. And so I wasn't going to let that bother me. Of uh, course, my uh, emphasis was on winning a, on a team game. Why uh, did Cousy never referred to Red Auerbach as Red? Is that right? He had eccentricities. Yeah, he, what did he call him? Arnold. Uh, Arnold. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, they had a, it started out a kind of a shaky relationship but evolved into a good relationship. Uh, when Cousy was a senior at Holy Cross, <clears throat> Red had, when it came to his pick, he did not pick Cousy. Uh, because Red's theory about uh, winning was put a team together that can play against the best team. And the rest of it will take care of itself. Which is solid, I think. Well, the dominant player was a guy named George McCann. Incidentally, one of the great guys that ever played in the NBA. Uh, so there was a kid, uh, a, well, a big guy from Bowling Green, could match McCann physically, and he had some skills. So Red drafted him. And uh, I said, well, what happened? He says, well, the press in Boston tried to crucify Red. Because they said how stupid he was not to draft Cousy. But everybody knew he was the best player in the world. So Red said, well, that's the way I want it. That's the way I think I should do it. One of the guys says, well, we're going to run you out of town. You've insulted all of us. And besides that, you're a Jew, and we don't like Jews either. <laughs> so, so I asked Red, how'd you handle that? He says, I'll just outlive the bastards. <laughs> so he had some of uh, Mr. Charlie's advice, or your mother's advice. Uh, that's, their pro that's their little red wagon. How's that? That's their little red wagon. Oh, you're yes. About it. Oh, yeah, that's... Uh, you know, uh, see, Red do what he's doing. Uh, you know, I don't know if most people know this. Red used to practice with us. He was a decent shooter. And uh, we, should, we had a game, we played 21, and he'd be out there with us all the time. See, he played college ball. In fact, uh, my first tournament in college was an all-college tournament in Oklahoma City. And uh, very interesting. The coach of uh, Wichita, who was, uh, it was eight teams. We were seated eighth, and Wichita was seated one. So what they do to you, if you're seated eighth, they throw you to the wolves. You have to play the first, play, top seed team, the first game. So they, it's like a warm up for them, okay? So the coach says he never heard of the USF. He thought it was San Francisco State. Well, when he got ready for the tournament, he found out it was USF. So he sent his brother out to scout us. Well, he picked the last game we lost in college to scout us, UCLA at Westwood. So he says, guys, I don't know anything about these guys. This is just before the game. He said, I don't know anything about these guys, but uh, my brother scouted them. He's going to give you a quick rundown. So his brother says, well, guys, I don't know how to tell you this, but these guys cannot play a lick. In fact, most of the good high school teams in the state of Kansas can beat these guys. They got... Two guards, when they, we changed uh, one of the guards since the last game that we lost. And uh, so the two guards can't put the ball in the ocean. Well, one of those guards was a guy named Casey Jones, 
who was a fair player. He said, they got this tall colored kid to play center. He does not do anything. And they never passing the ball. I, in our system, I never got, they never had a play for me to shoot. So all he does is stand around and he jumps a lot. Sometimes for no reason, he just stand there and jump. <laughs> And so, don't worry about it. Just go out and just run them out of the gym. And then the, the subs can play the rest of the game. I don't think that coach can play you started over 15 minutes. So, the game starts. Three minutes into the game, they call timeout. The score is 25 to 3. They couldn't, first of all, Casey Perry, full court press, they couldn't get the ball over half court. And when they got over half court, they threw up a shot out block and they did shoot layups. And so it was a disaster for them. Uh, Halftime, we were 30 points ahead. And, uh, and then when the next game, we played Oklahoma City University, and that was, we only beat them by 19. And so the championship game, we played George Washington. That's where Red went to college. And he played for, the, his coach was still coaching. And so, start the second half, we outscored him 22 to one. And so, after the game, Ron Hart, Red's old coach, college coach called Red up at midnight Hey, Red, I just saw something. I just saw the player, this is the one you want to get for the Celtics. Now, he's a junior. So you got two years to figure out how to get him for your team. And so that's when Red started to work on getting me to Boston. Mm. You know, it's amazing to me, you're talking about games over nearly 60 years ago. Uh, do you think any athlete at the level you played uh, remembers the, the, they're still vivid to you? Well, you know, I'll tell you what, my, my late wife uh, was always trying to do something for me. And so, she, she, I bought her, both of us got computers at the same time. And she had her computer, and I had my computer. And so, and learned her computer, she started going on eBay and see if there's anything on there. So one day she says, says, I got something for you. What's that? It's a basketball game, University of San Francisco, 1955. And uh, I think you in college did that play at the University of San Francisco. So we have a video of it, a tape. So we sat out and turned it on. And I said, oh, that's Oregon State at USF. She said, how'd you know? I said, I just saw that introduction. And I told her, truthfully, every play before it happened for the whole game. And she says, now how do you remember that that was 40 or 50 years ago? I says, there was a time before I tried to consciously stop doing it. I remembered every play of every game I ever played. I, I did that for scouting purposes. So that if I play this guy again, I know exactly what he does. See, because my defense was not reaction, it was action. Is I, you come up to me, Taylor, and your player, and you have a shot you want, I don't know. I'm gonna make you take the shot I want you to take. And, and then I play that. That's a remarkable way your brain works though. I mean, the only thing that I know that's comparable to it is 
friends of mine who can remember the lyrics of every music, you know, because that's an emotional tie. They, their head is stuffed with, with um, lyrics from music uh, from their childhood, but you can remember plays over a long career like that. It's really Even now, I've tried constantly to forget most of them. I remember plays that I did in high school. The game that I got the scholarship from, we were playing Oakland High at Oakland High. And I had one, three, and five leading scores in the conference on my team. So there was not much left over. <laughs> okay? So we had a close game in the first half. I scored the last three baskets of the first half. So we went into the last second half up by one point. We get down to the last uh, few minutes, and I scored the last four baskets for my team. And we won by one point, I think it was. Well, I remember every one of those plays. And they were all hustle plays, get them offensive rebounds. But uh, uh, for, mostly for scouting, for me, because uh, I was never going to be reacting the second time I played against you. The first time, you you might do a move and hey, okay, don't do it again. <laughs> at McClyman, just for um, for historical purposes, at McClyman's, your high school, uh, you uh, you were there at the same time Frank Robinson, the, base, the baseball player, was. Did you know him? Is that yeah? Oh, of course. Uh, Frank, in fact, Frank today. If I run to Frank, he'll tell me, you know, I was a better basketball player than you at McClyman's. <laughs> What's remarkable about Frank, he's a really good guy, and uh, my coach in high school was a uh, wonderful, wonderful man. He was the only white guy that would let the black kids play on his American Legion team. And so, at one time, he had 13 guys in the major leagues. And Frank was one of them, Vader Pinson, and more than just as important, a guy named Kurt Flood. Uh, these guys, uh, and I'll tell you the truth, when we were in high school, Frank was a great player. But all we ever heard about was a guy named J.W. Porter. He played for Oakland Tech. Big red-headed guy. And uh, according to the local press, J.W. could walk on water without getting his ankles wet. But uh, Frank, you know, he might have been all city, but J.W. was the man. Well, uh, i tell you a story about Frank, if you don't mind. We're in a golf tournament. Down in San Diego, sitting to my right is Frank Roberts. Sitting to my left, Bob Gibson, a Hall of Fame pitcher. So I brought up a conversation. I said, Frank, don't you hold a record for the most hit by a pitcher in the major leagues? He said, Yeah. I said, who hit you the most? <laughs> so, Bob Gibson um, was one of the few college guys in the major leagues when he was in the major league. You know, he went to Creighton. So, Bob is embarrassed by this. Sincerely embarrassed. So he says to me, Phil, let me tell you. I did not want to hit him all those times. So when Frank put his 
left elbow over the plate. So he took away the inside pitch. You couldn't throw inside because he was up over the plate. If you threw an inside pitch, you'd hit him. So he says, one day I decided, I'm just not going to hit him anymore. I'm just not going to do that. So I threw a pitch on the outside. We never did fire that baseball. <laughs> he said, well, I guess I'll have to hit him. <laughs> Singer? Well, Taylor, you got it backwards. I got it backwards. He high jumped with you. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was, I was just yeah. kidding. Yeah. No, he was, he's been a friend for at least, it seems like at least 60 years. And uh, he was a good high jumper. Uh, uh, I was uh, in the top five in the world include my freshman year. And uh, I went to a track meet up at University of Nevada, Reno. And I set the field record in high jump in less than three weeks. Johnny Matthews went up there and broke it. And I never forgave him for that either. <laughs> But he was, uh, you know, he played, he's a good basketball player. So we had a summer league, and he played at it. So we had an awards dinner, okay? So all the guys in the league were at this dinner. And so for the entertainment at the dinner, the MC said, uh, we're going to have one of our participants sing a song for us. Oh, boy. You know. No, I know any basketball player that could sing. <laughs> okay. So he gets up a cappella and sings Strange in Paradise. After the song, dead silence. Nobody in the place could believe what we just heard. You know, he was so good. And nobody even suspected he could sing. And, uh, but, so none of us were ever surprised when he went on to this great career. He has, he has had a great career since. Let, let's cover just a few of the other Celtics uh, okay. that you played with to do personality sketches of, I know you've talked about Sam Jones a little bit, but I, I think I remember you were saying that he, he could be exasperating because on the one hand, he was a great leader, on the other hand, you would tell him to call the plays, and he would say, I don't call the plays. So. Well, it started out when Sam was a rookie. Uh, in practice, Sam was as good a player as I'd ever seen, okay? So on the way home, I let him, because the way this salary structure was, you didn't get paid until the season started. So all through training camp, all you got was meal money. So uh, I brought Sam home with me, and they stayed with me until he started getting paid. Okay. So all the way home after practice, I said, Sam, you can really play. He said, I know it. So I said, why don't you play like that all the time? You could be first team all league. You could make a lot of money. He said, I don't want to do that. I said, why not? I do not want to have to play like that every day. He says, that, that'll wear you out as much as playing. The responsibility of, you know that if you don't play well, the team's not doing well. I said, okay, Sam, I can live with that. You know, and so, Sam could have been one of the, I thought, one of the all-time greats if he had wanted to. Uh, he, oh, it was great, I thought. Because uh, in our 
run a, uh, he was on 10 championship teams. He was never an innocent bystander. And uh, at least six times that I can recall, Sam took the shot that meant the season. And he never hesitated to take the shot, and he never missed. Now, uh, a couple of other guys were, like Tom Heinsohn, everybody thought of him as a big, gruff, hard-nosed guy. Tommy was a, an artist and a poet. He said, Heinsohn, a poet? <laughs> You know, and one of the all-time, for me, one of the all-time good guys, okay? And one of my teammates, one of my favorite teammates. You said that Red had to motivate him differently than he motivated you, oh, yeah. right? Well, Red would have had a system he'd figure out. Uh, part of his strategy was, how many minutes can you play in a row and be effective? And so he'd start Heinz, and at the end of six minutes, he'd take him out. And no matter how he's playing. And so Heinz said that great public statement, uh, Red, you hold me up to public scorn. <laughs> and, and Red says, to hell with it. He said, why are you taking him out after six minutes? If he's playing good, he's tired. If he's not playing good, I mean, if he's not tired, he ain't playing good. <laughs> so, at six minutes, get him out of there. <laughs> and uh, so, Heinz is considered Red using him as a whipping boy. And uh, there was some justification for feeling that way. You know, and, uh, but Red actually really cared for the players. What about uh, Ramsey? Uh, no, you, you know, Ramsey. Frank, Frank Ramsey. I, we got along from the first moment we met. And, uh, cause Frank and I were only interested, in, we're both interested in, this, only interested in one thing, winning. And that's, that's his whole thing. Now, Red used a, I call it, almost a sack job, but Frank is too smart to use a sack job. Uh, Frank, well, when he got there, he had been in the Army, and he got there, he was playing on, with us on weekend passes. So, we was always coming off the bench. And so, next year, Sam, uh, Frank is coming on the bench. And Red talks to him and says, now, you should be a starter. And I will never refer to you as second team. I will call you my sixth starter. And you will always be my first substitute. Well, that took care of all of us had egos, and all of us wanted to be started or whatever. So Frank bought it. So Frank personified six men. In fact, they named a, an award in the NBA after what Frank started. And uh, I'll never get one night I got one of my front teeth knocked out. I never had anything like that happen. So I go, I look at this, one of my front teeth in my hand. And I'm, I, I, I don't know what to do. So I said to Frank, look at that. And Frank took out his bridge, where was both his front teeth. He said, here, Russ, look at that. <laughs> Kentucky, right? Yes, and you know what's really funny was 
His coach had said they shouldn't have let these black guys play, or the Jews either. And uh, coming from that atmosphere, Frank and I never discussed it. We were teammates with this idea we both win, and both us showed the other guy complete and total respect. You know, and uh, I never get after one of our championships, Frank says, hey, Russ, after the season's over, why don't you come down and spend a week with me down in Kentucky? I said, Frank, you're a good guy. There's no way in hell I'm going to go spend a week in Kentucky. <laughs> How about Havlicek? He 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 took that six-man role from Ramsey, right? Yeah, when, when Frank showed him how to do it. Uh huh. And uh, as Havlicek had played in college, you always hit the open man. Well, in pro ball, you set up to the best shooter gets the shots, you know. And so we give him. Uh, 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 have a check the ball, and nobody even in ten feet, and he's looking for somebody to pass to. Have a check, shoot the ball. Okay, okay. So this goes on for a while. So one night he took us up, shot thirty-eight times. <laughs> so to show you kind of guys we were, what kind of team we had. We get the trainer to leave the bench early and go to the locker room and fill a tub with ice. And so when we came out of the game, after the game, we had to, we all ice down half a chick's arm. Because <laughs> he had shot some, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, we all had something we did well. And we always tried to put our teammates in a position to do what they did well. So that every play consisted of five guys doing something. And so that uh, when you got an open shot, because we all worked to get you an open shot. And uh, that was part of our thing. And it's like we almost developed what we call the Celtic way. Is that uh, uh, the attitude was be kind to your teammates. Now, what does that sound like in pro, pro ball? Well, what do you mean by be kind? Well, first of all, what is kindness? Kindness is an act of strength. I can do this and I will do that. Okay? That's strength and kindness. Okay? So, like uh, Satch was guarding uh, Bill Bradley one night in Madison Square Garden. And Bradley was shooting him out to jail. I mean, he, he was good moving without the ball. So I says to Satch, hey, Satch, this is the time when I said, that's something you ought to know. On the Knickerbocker uniforms, there's a small number in front and a big number on the back. I know you haven't seen that small number. <laughs> but there is one. <laughs> so, story happened. Bill Bradley told me about it. That same game. Bradley's having a good night. So we line up for free throws, 
And Ben Wilkins on that side, Satch and Bradley on the other side. I was a captain, so I called time out. I walk across the lane. Now, I don't know if this language is okay for your thing is. I think it'll be all right. So I walk over to Satch, and Bradley, who told me the story later, because I, I pointed to Bradley, I says, can you guard that motherfucker? <laughs> now that shocked Bradley. He'd never been called that before. <laughs> That was the idea. So I said, yeah, I said, we'll guard him, God damn it. And we back across the lane. And Bill Bradley told the story later, he said, he never hit another shot. <laughs> he said, because I had thrown him off, you know. And that was the idea of, of uh, we should try all kind of weird things to, to get so your comment was aimed at Bradley, not oh, yeah. at Satch. Right. I'm looking at Satch, but I was, it was aimed at Bradley. Yeah, yeah. You paused for a second. Sure. Um, we're rolling again. I'd like to um, I'd like to shift a little bit to talking about race themes. You've talked about them a little bit uh, growing up that your mom didn't want you around white folks, and that when you and that when you went to the USF for the first time, you're in a sea of white folks right. and Jesuits to boot on a Jesuit campus there at, at San Francisco, but obviously you, you, you've you dealt with race your whole life. The, a lot of the talk that you've, um, when, when we've discussed it, had been basically about perspective and how people see things and what people are not conscious of. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you, you said that uh, the first time you went to the movies and you saw King Kong, the movie, you yeah. came out of there with a different perspective than anybody else in the theater. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I look at this as big old gorilla, okay? That he's been taking these uh, sacrifices, obviously for years and years. The first time they put a white woman out there, he fell in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just thought that was odd. <laughs> but most people didn't. Most people saw, saw that as the romance of the film. You said um, that often he'd had sacrifices and he, of, of, of African women, that he would come and take them and kill them and probably eat them. But the first time he puts a white woman out there, he falls in love with his food. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just... How people look at things and what people take for granted. I, you said, was it your high school coach that said you can't fight on the basketball court because if black kids fight, it's a it's a riot, and if yes. white kids fight, it's a skull. Yeah, this is the same guy that uh, my high school coach. He says, let's keep things in perspective. Uh, no fighting. It's not because I'm afraid that you're afraid. I don't think that at all. But if we get into three fights, we are a bunch of thugs. And, and you know, no matter how well we play, just those thugs from the climbers. Well, so when guys, when they find out how good you are, there'll be guys that are trying to pick a fight. Because that's the only way they think they can compete. Well, when they try to pick a fight, you don't fight. You play harder. And you beat them with a game of basketball. That you have to play harder. Because, yeah. because in, in effect, the, the yes. race, you have to make up for that. Yeah. Well, I know when I was a rookie with the Celtics, none of us in the league had ever seen me play because I played on the West Coast. And uh, so uh, this guy I played against told me this story years later. He was a center for the Fort Wayne Pistons. They were before they went to Detroit. And uh, 
We started the game, he'd never seen me play. And the first five shots he took, I blocked him. Well, his coach had been a referee, had a real scratchy voice, and you could hear him all over the gym. And he says, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, let that rookie embarrass you like that. Damn rookie, let, look at him, he making you look bad. You embarrassed all of us. And so this guy listen to this for about five minutes. And he says, now, what am I, I, I got to get out of this. What am I going to do? Okay. I know that he will fight. Okay. So I'm going to hit him. He, we're going to get into a fight, and we'll both get thrown out of the game for fighting. There were a couple of things he did not know. I would never fight in the first quarter. We, we get to the last quarter, now we can talk about it. <laughs> okay? So he just turned around and hit me in the chest. Whack! Knocked my breath out of me. And so I just looked at him. And I didn't say a word because I used to never talk. And so what he did not know that between high school and college, I had worked in the shipyards, San Francisco Naval Shipyard. And we had a lunchtime volleyball competition. And so I learned how to spike the ball. You know, we better on spike it. So the next time he shot, I spiked it right in his head. That's no foul. That's just competition. The next three times he shot, the third time he shot and ducked. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, of race in, in basketball, I'm, I want to transition after the break to talk a little bit about your time in Boston. The Celtics, as you said earlier, were the first team in the NBA to draft a black player. They were also, Boston, the Red Sox, were the last baseball team uh, to take a black player. Um, uh, not until night, 12 years after Jackie Robinson did they get Pumpsy Green. So when you were in Boston, it was a, it was a city that was... Just its two sports teams were the first and last on that. Yeah. How, how racial? How did? How did you learn about race in Boston? Well, it didn't take very long. Uh, you know, uh, like that long ever got there, they started having problems with the busing and all that kind of stuff, and they were very uh, negative about it. Uh, and like a couple of sports writers told Heisen that they would never vote for me for anything. Okay? I'll give you an example. 1969. We were the ch our second championship in a row. Okay? They had a parade on Friday. Friday afternoon. <clears throat> Friday morning, a reporter from the Boston Herald walked into Red's office and said, are you satisfied with the coaching you had this year? Red said, what the hell are you talking about? We just won a championship. He said, yeah, but if you'd had a better coach, couldn't you have won more regular season games? All it was, they did not want Bill Russell or any black guy coaching their Celtics, which finally become theirs. And Red says to me, calls me up after the guy leaves. He says, do you believe this? I said, Red, it doesn't make any difference. I'm not going to do that stuff anymore anyway. That's how I announced I was retiring. And the reason I never said anything about retiring before, there had been a tradition with the Celtics. The guys announced before the last season, before the season starts, this is going to be their last year. 
Well, Sam Jones had announced that this was going to be his last year. There's no way I was going to ever raid on Sam's parade and say, well, I'm retired too. No, no, that's, no, that's not, you can't do that. You know, uh, not to uh, a player I held in such high esteem as Sam Jones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Red says to me, don't tell anybody, because I got to try to change your mind. Tell you how respectful Red was. He never ever mentioned that again. Hmm. You know, and uh, because of when he decided to retire as a coach, I said, Red, why don't you coach one more year and I can retire with you? He says, no, I've had it, this is it. And I never brought that up again. Because I respect that he was a, an intelligent, thoughtful man. And if he decided to do that, all he could do is say, it's been great fun, Red. That's all you could do. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing he said with me, you know. You know, in fact, uh, tell you how the Celtics were to me. My, I call them my Celtics. That's Walter Brown and Red, Red Orbach. In the middle 60s, Walter Brown called me up and says, uh, I need to talk to you. Okay, where do you want to do it? He says, well, where can you get in here? I said, well, Walter, I don't have a job. I can come in right now. He says, well, I'll wait for you. So I go into Walter Brown's office and he's sitting there with a, his desk is full of papers and stuff. He says, see these papers? I say, yeah. Not very neat. Uh, he says, those are the papers of the Boston Celtics. Those are the books for the Boston Celtics. And the reason I'm showing them to you is I want you to go through them. We don't pay you enough. You know it. I know it. And anybody that's interested knows that we don't pay you enough. But I'm always, I'm already paying you more than I can afford because we're losing money. But I want you to know that we know that you're underpaid. And we can't afford to pay you more now. But as soon as if we, if we make enough money that we can, I'll make it up to you. And he says, oh, of course, you never held us up. You could have held us up, but you didn't. And I want you to know that I appreciate it. As a consequence, after Walter died, my last contract with the Celtics, Red gave me an eight-year no-cut contract at 35. That means I could play for the Celtics if I wanted to until I was 43. But in order to collect, I did not have to play. I could bring my doctor in and say, I want to play this year. But my doctor says he doesn't think I can do it. Then they got to pay me for that year. Now, uh, I only played one year on that contract, and then I left. And they said, well, why did you take the money? I said, I could not take money that I did not earn. I got that from my father. Yeah. Same reason he didn't want your money. You right. Earn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's take a break. Is that all right? Okay, we're going now. Let's talk some about your philosophical views and also public life uh, outside of sports. We're going to talk more about sports too. But from very early on, 
it seemed to me that you started thinking about how sports fit into other life. You used to say even that sports was a mixture of art and war and that it was like politics, religion, um, and the arts, that, that sports could gather people. Uh, when did you start thinking philosophically about the place of sports in life? Well, I think it, uh, when my high school coach told us no fighting. You understand me? And uh, you have to be aware. I think the key phrase to me has been <clears throat> it is far more important to understand than it is to be understood. <clears throat> and so, uh, Take things as they come. It's like you walk into this room, and it is. Now, what's good or bad is your perception. Right or wrong is your perception. And after you make a judgment, the next question is, <clears throat> what are you going to do about it? Okay, so now if you lose control, you will end your life being a bitter, annoyed old man. But if you take control of your life as much as possible, because you understand then uh, you didn't have a chance to be happy. You know, of course, uh, now, uh, when I was in college, I found out that there were not any blacks that were top of their field, no matter what sport. Now, uh, you take Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. If Willie Mays had hit 100 home runs in a season, Mickey Mantle still would have been the best baseball player. Now, Willie could get annoyed by that, or he just go out and say, well, next year I'll have to hit 200. A go a you know what I mean? And so uh like uh my junior year in college, I'm gonna have to tell you about it. We were twenty eight and one. We won the foul four. I was outstanding player in the foul four. I was first team all American. Averaged 20 points and 20 rebounds, and they never counted block shots until four or five years after retiring from the NBA. Okay? So, first team all American. We go to Northern California Sports Banquet, and they picked another center's player of the year. Now, I could have been injured. But what I did, for me eternally, I dismissed that award as something that I would like. And I really was able to do that. And so, uh, I had made up my mind that <clears throat> I was going to be the best basketball player I could be. And this team, I have no regard for the coach or the rest of the players. 
All I thought about was being the best basketball player I could be. Well, I was very good, and that made my team win. But I wasn't going to let uh, my self-esteem be tied up on what others said about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You see, it's like uh, <clears throat> you said that the Celtics had more fun than any team around. Was that essential to winning or was that an accident? I think it was essential to winning. Uh, <clears throat> because it, it may sound overblown, but we actually looked out for each other. And if a guy was having a bad night, we were counseling, always, Use humor. Toughening humor, right? You made yeah. fun of me. You yeah. couldn't be, you couldn't be thin-skinned and be a Celtic, right? Right. Well, you know, uh, I know if a guy's having a bad time and he's hurting our team, how can we help him out? Well, first of all, we could help him out physically, but let him know that mentally we were. Therefore, if he needed if he needed help, we'll give it to him. And he should not be ashamed to ask for help. You see, uh, in the macho world, men are usually reluctant to ask for help. Well, uh, one night we played the Philadelphia Sixers in Boston Garden. And I was doing my very best, and not that well, Garden Will Chamberlain. Okay. <laughs> I do it, he do it, and everybody in the building do it. So I kept hearing this whop sound, whop, whop, whop. And what it was, Casey was trying to help me out. So every time he went by Will, he'd hit him. And so I, I look back and Casey go by and whack and hit me. I said, time out, time out. We go to Rich and Rich says, what's the matter? I said, Rich, excuse me. Casey, what are you doing? He says, what's the matter? You afraid, big fella? I said, you got damn right I am. I said, you go by and hit him. I got to wrestle with that big monster all night. <laughs> I said, now, it's hard enough, but you're going to get him riled up and make him easy, make him impossible. <laughs> and so, it was Casey taking a chance to get into a fight to help me. Hmm. Because he could see I needed help. You know? And it went all through the lineup that way. When you were coming up into into the pro sports, did you have any role models or athletes that you look up to at all, like like Jackie Robinson? Or? Uh, well, Jackie, of course, in basketball, was a guy named George Mikan. The center for the Minneapolis Lakers? Well, you know, uh, when he started playing for DePaul, his folks thought he was going to a seminary to be a priest. And so his father said to him one night, George, there's a guy with the same name as you playing for DePaul. <laughs> <laughs> and they were shocked that he was, that was their son that was playing for DePaul. And uh, you see, when I was a kid in, in Oakland, in elementary and junior high school especially, Oakland had a major, minor league baseball team, the Oakland Acorns who played in Emeryville. Well, we used to go out there. We couldn't afford to go in the park. And we wait and see if anybody hit a home run. You could take that ball and go in and get, us, and get, us, get in. And so, but we found that the worst creatures to ever invade the earth were minor league baseball players. 
They would come out of the games and they see us and they call us the N word, spit tobacco at us, and act indecently. So, my view of professional athletes was not positive at all. So, when I went to an exhibition game, the Lakers were playing, and this guy that went to, yes, if I want to, he played high school ball with Jim Pollard, who was a big star with the Lakers. And he said, want to go to the locker room? I said, no, I don't want to go there with those people. You know? And so I, I said, I'll wait out here. So he goes in there. And so while I was waiting, George Mackey comes out. He sees me and he walks over me. How you doing, big fella? Well, that was a real joke. Mackey was 6'10", 280. And I was 6'7", 100. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, how you doing, big fella? He said, you play center? I said, yeah. He said, well, he showed me a couple of moves that he used. I says, now listen, when you get out of college, you got to come play for the Lakers. Now, I could even make my homeroom team. <laughs> <laughs> and and college was I had no scholarships or nothing. And so I'd been working a shipyard to save enough money to go to college. I couldn't pay my own way. So Mike says, uh, after you got out of college you gotta come play for the Lakers. And that was a he was the number one guy in basketball. And he talked so nice to me, he wasn't condescending or anything. He was talking to me like I was another ball player. Well, that's, that's going back more than 50, 60 years or something like that. And uh, we think race relations would have been horrible back then. But, and they were, because you've never been rosy about it. But you're saying that even back in those periods, there are always exceptions to the rule. This is a well, really you know, remember guy. I told you, his folks thought he was going to be in the seminary. Yeah. And, uh, but he was just a good person. And I tell you, one of the greatest rewards I had was after George died, they had a private ceremony for his family. And I was invited. Because George and I had been friends. You know, uh, we had a thing in L.A. We did a TV show or something. And uh, George says, uh, Bill, I want you to do me a big favor. I need a big favor from you. I'll understand if you said no. I said, what is it, George? He said, I want to introduce you to my son. Are you kidding? That's a favor? You know, so he introduced me to his son. And he says to his son, I want you to meet Bill Russell, the greatest son that ever played base basketball. And I said, George, people forget. He said, he won three championships in five years. He was the man in basketball. But it wasn't on television and all that, so most people didn't know that. But uh, I was so flattered that uh, this man had been so nice to me. You know, a lot of people say very, very insensitive things to kids. And I hope that I never do that. You know, uh, because you can injure kids But not being just, uh, well, I have this thing that uh, how I get along. Uh, let the first thing out of your mouth be your second thought. Because the first one is the one that might injure a kid. <laughs> yeah, or you knew. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of your sayings was always that that you don't believe there's any such thing as other people's kids. Right, well, uh, 
I was speaking at a school in Fort Worth, Texas. And there was, they were winding down the Vietnam War. And I said, instead of spending all that money killing peasants, we should take that money and repair our educational system because we haven't paid enough attention to it. And we haven't paid enough money to it. And so after the speech, one guy comes and says, well, listen, your speech was all right except for one thing. What you talk about is raising my taxes. And why should I pay taxes to educate other people's kids? And I said to him, two reasons you should pay taxes. One, when you were six, and your folks bottled you up and sent you off to school, there was a school there for you to go to. And your folks did not build it. It was there. And second, there are no other people's kids in the United States. That's the next generation of Americans. And if we don't educate them, we'll lose all the things that we think are important. Because if we're not one of the top educated societies, we will not be able to, to, to compete internationally. And so we have a choice of either building our schools or picking a war. And I don't think picking a war is the best option. Will you talk a little bit about your relationship to the civil rights movement? I know uh, because that was during your playing career, it was, uh, it was around for a lot of it. I know once you went to Mississippi in the summer of 1964 for Charles Evers, uh, the brother of Medgar Evers, a year after he was killed. Well, you know, I was never big on organizations. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was, if you say something as part of an organization, you can be dismissed as a mouthpiece for an organization. And so they don't have to deal with what you're saying. Uh, when Medgar Evers got shot, we had a uh, moral service for him in Boston at the Boston Common. And I sat next to Charlie Evers, his brother. And so, I don't know what I was thinking. But I told him, does there anything I can do? Here's my home number. He used it. <laughs> <laughs> so he called me that summer and says, oh, We've taken a hit. Uh, morale wise. And uh, we're we're down the lowest we've been. And so we need somebody to give us a boost. To show somebody from outside cares. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He says, well, you know what would be a good idea? Right in your field of expertise, why don't you do some clinics, basketball clinics, in Jackson, Mississippi, and surrounding towns? Invite everybody. Any kid that wants to come can come to your clinics. I said, I can do that. So I went down and did clinics. And, uh, I actually enjoyed myself, and uh, and Charlie says to me, "You know we're not going to let anything happen to you." I said, "Okay," and so I had armed guards 
I'll tell you, I, but they were like the Secret Service. You never knew they were around. But uh, that gave me such a, a, a high. The that was 1964. This is Mississippi Freedom Summer. They, yeah. Werner, Cheney, and Goodman, the first three civil rights workers, on the very first night were were murdered. It was a frightful place to be going to. Yes. And you're not exactly inconspicuous. <laughs> well, you know, I was uh, I was invited years later to the McDonald's High School All-Star Game, okay, in uh, Indiana. And so I went there, and I had a good time. And after I spoke, they asked me to take pictures, a picture with each one of the participants, boys and girls. It was two games, a boys game and a girls game. So one of those is the, the female high school player of the year was a young lady from Colorado. And so uh, she was, while they were setting the picture up, she says, Mr. Russell, I'd like to say something to you. You said something today in your speech that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. What? She said to us, do not be afraid. Because all decisions made out of fear are usually bad decisions. And uh, you go into a new world from high school to college, into college into the world. Do not be afraid. Because you're all right. You got this far? Do not be afraid. Well, I, I may be not too bright, but I cannot recall the last time I was afraid. And uh, the society I live in, Every time I can do something, I see it as an opportunity. Could you tell me a little bit about your relationships with the uh, other civil rights figures from that period? Did you ever meet Malcolm X or Martin Luther King? Well, uh, I just briefly mm -hmm. knew Malcolm X, mm -hmm. okay? I know uh, Louis Farrakhan. Uh, he's been to my house a few times. Because uh, he came out with, uh, before he changed the alley, he was Cassius Clay. And the reason Cassius was coming to my house was uh, I was a gold medal winner in the 56 Olympics. And uh, I always had affection for gold medal winners uh, because I know what it takes, you know. And uh, and so I and I knew uh, the last the, the March on Washington. I stayed in the same hotel as Reverend Martin Luther King. And so we met in the lobby and had a brief conversation. And I told him I was there for the march. And he invited me to go on stage with, the, you know, when he made the big speech. And I respectfully declined. And the reason I declined was they had worked for a couple of years to put that thing together. And I hadn't done anything. And it would not be right, I didn't think, for me to go on stage and say, hey, listen, this is what we've done. 
and I hadn't done anything. <laughs> so I sat in the first row and enjoyed it, but uh, I didn't want to be one of those guys. Hey, look at me. Do you know if there's a photograph of you at the March on Washington? Have you ever seen one? What's that? Do you know if there's a photograph of you there? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I was just one of the guys, or one of the people there to support that. Do you remember when he was killed? That's during the season in your next to last year, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, when he was killed, we were playing a game the night he got killed in Philadelphia. And uh, they asked us, they asked both teams, what do you think? You think we should not, we should call the game off or play? Now, we think it would be a bad thing for the city of Philadelphia if we call the game off and you got 12, 13,000 people under great stress. And uh, really, really annoyed. That's a quiet way of putting it. On the, the streets. And so we said, what we'll do is we play the game and we keep these 12, 13,000 people in the game in time to cool off so that you don't have riots in the street in Philadelphia. And that's the reason we played that game. Then we didn't play for a week or so. But uh, we, those are things we thought about. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you uh, know Ali much after you, uh, when you said... Um, oh yeah, I knew him when he was a, 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 a kid boxer and uh, always a fan because uh, to reach the top of your field, it takes more than physical ability. You have to know what you're doing to get to the top of your field, no matter what the field. Because there are things you have to do to execute what it takes to be the top of your field. And so, uh, Ali was a uh, not only a great, great boxer, but he's a psychologist and uh, a brave, brave man. I was in Boston one day, and a guy says, I want you to disavow Muhammad Ali. What? I want you to put him in his place. So I'm not going to do anything like that. Uh, he said, you want this a bomb? I said, heck no. He said, well, I think you ought to do that. I said, I don't care what you think. If I had a choice between you and Ali, you wouldn't even be in the race. <laughs> Are you kidding? So he started calling me Felton X after that. You know, uh, they used to call the Muslims with an X. You know, Malcolm X and all that. Us, you know. Uh, didn't you, uh, when he got drafted, did, didn't you organize a group of... I didn't organize, Jim Brown organized. Jim Brown organized, but you he, joined it, right? Oh, yeah. Just, just to support his decision. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, you see, the thing is, what you have to think about is, for his decision not to go in the Army, if you read what it was based on, arbitrarily they decided to change his status without a hearing or anything. Just, we're going to change it. Well, that's not right. You know, from what, uh, what category he was in, I, I'm not sure, but they changed it to 1A. So because now we're going to put you in the Army. Well, you can't do that. 
<laughs> you know? You know, that's a... Was that... I, I, I'm groping for... Was a way to ask, what was the time that you felt was most controversial, your most controversial stance? Who, me? Yeah, in your career, when you got the most heat for something that uh, you felt or believed or said or didn't say. Well, it started with, when I got to Boston, I had not started to shave. Okay? You know, you, you reach a certain age and you say, okay, now you shave. I hadn't reached that when I got to Boston. So I spent the first three or four months there explaining why I had a beard and why I shouldn't shave it off. And the more they questioned, the more I dug in my heels, <laughs> you know, because uh, going back to college as a freshman, they had to buy you a pair of shoes, basketball shoes. And I bought a pair of white ones. And the varsity coach says, uh, we wear black shoes. I said, that's the varsity. This is the freshman team. He said, you should get black shoes so you be like the rest of them. I said, coach, I had nothing I could ever do to look like the rest of these guys. There were two black guys <laughs> on the on on there were four black guys on the varsity and the junior varsity on the freshman. So there's no way I was gonna look like the rest of those guys. You know, and so uh one thing I got from my dad was to analyze and come to conclusions from my own perspective. See, I cannot tell you who your hero should be. And uh, you'd be wrong if you think you could tell me who my hero should be. In fact, uh, who was it? Uh, Bill Walton, who's a dear friend. And I think a really good guy, okay? We were talking about growing up, and at the end of the conversation, he said to me, we come from two different worlds. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, a friend of mine is a young guy named Yao Ming. Uh, he plays, you know, he's retired now. He was playing for the Houston Rockets, and he asked if he could have a conversation with me. I said, okay. So he came to my house for dinner, here. And uh, we were talking about his career. And I said, there's one thing you should be very aware of and never lose sight of. You are a very tall Chinese man. Embrace it. I says, uh, always embrace your mother and father and the culture you grew up in. And, uh, I said, always be true to who you are and what you are. And uh, that, to me, is a positive thing, not a negative thing. Because I can, you can be Chinese and love the Chinese without hating the Americans, which some people were trying to conclude. You see, you can uh, embrace who you are and what you are and be a positive impact in your life. Let's pause for just a second. Okay.
Okay. Okay, we're rolling. We're ready to go? All right, we want to resume talking a little bit about your relationship with the city of Boston and how it changed from the time you were back there playing until modern days when you've, um, when you've made peace to some degree with uh, certain people there. Um, that never happened. It never happened. Uh, see, what well, other people thought I was bothered, but I, I was never bothered. I was, you know, they got my attention about certain things, but uh, I always was able to maintain control. Just like uh, one of the things that annoyed the media there was they turned their head, they looked up, and I was gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it just, uh, I told Red, uh, I'm finished. That I'm not going to do it anymore. He's all what I told. You know, and uh, they, uh, they were under the misconception that the things that they valued and the things that I valued were different. And uh, as I told someone last month, uh, I never ever need to be validated. Mm -hmm. You know, I came, I did what I did, and then I left. And uh, just like I told those guys on NBA TV, they said, uh, how come they never pick you as the greatest player I ever played? I said, first of all, that's irrelevant. And I don't even get into that. Because nobody can know who the best player was. Because there is not an accepted standard that this is what the great player does. Now, Spectators uh, are the only real experts. Like, I, I want to tell you a story if you got time. I was working for CBS, and there was a game. Uh, the Lakers played the Sixers in Philadelphia, and Magic had to play center because Kareem <clears throat> was home with a migraine. And we were in a production meeting, and the announcer, who will go unnamed, short said, we're going to have to start promoting it. It's the sixth game. If the Lakers won, it was over. If the Sixers won, it had to go to the seventh game. So the announcer kept saying, well, we're going to have to start promoting the seventh game a little later than the end of the first quarter. So the third time he said that, he said, uh, I said, why are you saying that? He said, well, without Kareem, the Lakers can't compete. And that game will be over the first eight minutes. I said, the Lakers are going to win the game. And you know what he said to me? You do not know what you're talking about. Normally, I just let it slide. But that time, I just didn't feel like letting it slide. I said, yes, I do. I said, I know more about playoff basketball than anybody you ever meet. And he says, well, how can you say that? I said, there are certain criteria uh, you use in playoffs. First, there's matchups. You take Magic out of the backcourt and you're left with Norm Nixon and Michael Cooper up against Andrew Tony and Maurice Cheeks. That's a wash. Nobody has the advantage. I said, the way Jamal Wilkes is playing, he in the dock, that's a wash. 
other forward, uh, Andrew, uh, Jim Jones, and either uh, Caldwell Jones or uh, Chuck and Thunder. Okay, so you you said that those were a wash and and uh, Dale Dawkins, uh, Caldwell Jones, and uh, uh, of the Sixers, Jim Jones. It, that would be a Sixers advantage. Mm -hmm. I said, but the guy that's left is completely out of it. He's got to try to guard Magic. Magic's big and strong enough to guard him, but he can't even catch up with Magic. In fact, uh, Magic, I surmise, was in the top three fastest guys in the league in foot speed. So the, this guy, Magic Plant Center, he can't, he, all, he, he never see Magic in fact. I said, so, uh, okay, that's just matchups. This will be the sixth straight game that the Lakers have played this sixer team. During the way, get to the sixth game, they've made adjustments, made adjustments. They made adjustments, so they're familiar. Okay, now this is the first game that the Sixers will have played this Laker team with Magic at center. As great as Kareem is, you always know where to find him. He's down on the blocks, either left or right side. Magic. He might be selling popcorn for, you know, you know, he'd be all over the building. Okay. So now the Sixers are going to have to start making adjustments as they go along tonight. By the time they make adjustments to this team, it'll be late in training camp next season. <laughs> I said, so, uh, if the Sixers were to play the best game that any team in history's franchise had ever played, they would still lose. They do not have a chance. Wow. Did you say that on the air, too? No, I said that in the production meeting. Right, right. And so uh, we go in there, and exactly what I told you would happen, happen. Jamal Wilkes got 35 points. Magic was uncontrollable. The backcourt was washed. In fact, a kid named Brad Holland came off the bench and got 10 points. And so uh, the Sixers never had a chance. Oh, they were a good team. Uh, they basically went to the sixth game unarmed. Yeah. You know, and so these are the kind of things you have to know to win in the playoffs because every game is different. Let's go if back. The, if the coach is any good, that's okay. Let's go back to where we were talking a little bit before about your famous autograph policy. You surprised me. I didn't know this by saying that it, 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 you didn't have it when you first started with the Celtics, but it came about almost by accident a few years later over yeah. signing basketball. In 1964 is when I finally made a decision, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And you said it had to do with signing basketballs? Well, that's where it started. Well, uh, and by the time I started to get just a bit cranky, okay, and at the off basketball court, nobody could tell me what to do, okay? That's Anita. We can yell at her if you want to. Uh, I spent from that time in 64, I think is where I stopped, until today. You'd be surprised that people try to figure a way to make me sign autographs. You know, and uh, 
when I first took the coaching job at Boston, uh, they asked me to do, the Red asked me to do a couple of TV shows. And so this one guy says, well, now that you're coaching, you're going to have to start signing autographs. I said, no, I'm not. He hasn't read Corey and told you that you got to start signing autographs because you're part of management. I said, first of all, Red knew what I was before you offered me the job. I didn't just all of a sudden say, okay, now that I'm the coach, I'm not going to sign autographs. That's been my policy for years at the time. And I said, you, people keep asking me about that, and I want to tell you one thing, okay? If I say to you, I'm not going to sign autographs, that's the end of it. There's nobody you could tell that says, okay, you sign autographs. I said, if Almighty God said to me, you sign autographs, and I said no. Even he cannot make me sign autographs, if it's a he. Uh, he could strike me dead. <laughs> but one of the things that God gave us all is a free will. And so, if I say I'm not going to do it, there's no point in talking about it. That's, that's not going to happen. Didn't you say that some of the Celtics... Uh, uh, Faked your signature on basketballs, though? Oh, yeah. Uh, Heinsohn, Ramsey, Sam. I think sometimes Casey. <laughs> they used to have a contest who could do the best Bill Russells. So there are a lot of counterfeit Russell autographs out there on basketballs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can remember in the 70s being out at, at, at um, restaurants with you when people would come up right in restaurants and walk right up and, and ask you to sign an autograph. And my memory is that you would say, because usually they would have their kids there, you would say, if you want to sit down and say hello and have a conversation, that's fine, but I'm not going to sign an autograph. No, I said, uh, one of the kids one time asked me about signing autographs. I said, to me, to you, it is not personal. It's a matter of policy. I said, I don't sign autographs. That goes for everybody, not just you, you know. And uh, I have a choice, and I make the choice. And so uh, most of the kids understand it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I used to always joke about, the guy says, I want you to sign an autograph. I said, I don't want to sign an autograph. He said, for my kid? I said, that's a bad trade. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right in remembering that when you were asked about playing for Boston, you would say you never played for Boston, you played for the Celtics? That's right. I played for the Celtics. For the team. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, after I retired, I moved to L.A. right away. And I was a season ticket holder for four years for the Los Angeles Lakers. And uh, they had a ceremony for Jerry West. And they said, oh, would you come? Of course, I like Jerry a lot. So while I was there, they put me in a box next to Jack Ken Cook, who owned the team. That was an experience. Anyway, a couple of days later, I get a call from Jack Kent Cook. He says, uh, I've been thinking about it, and I made a decision. I'm going to get you to come out of retirement and play for the Lakers. So I said, aren't you playing a guy named Will Chamberlain, a lot of money, to play for the Lakers. Now, how would he feel about being a backup center? <laughs> Jack and Cook didn't think that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, no. I don't play basketball anymore. And if I did, it was only be for the Celtics. 
that's the, all the time I would play basketball. Could you talk a little bit about um, your relationship with um, the Red Sox over the over the uh, issue of uh, throwing out the first ball and your mentoring foundation and how that developed uh, into your retirement recently? Well, when I was in uh, Tomanito, the mayor of Boston, asked me to come back to the Democratic National Convention and co-host his receptions. And uh, he had the receptions in community centers all around Boston. And so while I was there, my agent at the time had set up for me to go out. It was the last series of the year with the Red Sox and the Yankees. And so that's a big deal in Boston. So he had set up for me to go out and throw out the first pitch. And so he says, we got to be over Fenway by 11. I said, I'm not going to Fenway Park. He says, why not? I says, because I'm not. I have nothing to do with the Red Sox. He says, well, I've already set it up. I said, well, you have to unset it because I'm not going to do it. I'm not have nothing to do with the Red Sox. I said, as far as I'm concerned, the Red Sox can burn in hell for eternity. <laughs> and, uh, and why was that? Well, when I was with the Celtics, the guy that owned the Red Sox said he would never have a black player. In fact, they were the last of the major league teams to get a black player. They do not owe me or any other black person anything. That's their business to run the way they want to run it. That does not mean I have to associate with them. So, uh, I was at a reception and some lady walked up and said, she works for the Red Sox. I said, okay. She said, well, why don't you come out and throw the first pitch? I said, I'm not having anything to do with the Red Sox. She said, well, the Red Sox have changed. This is different. I said, when you show me that you have a program to facilitate the change, maybe we'll talk. That don't mean I'm going to come through. I said, you're not going to keep the same policy and get Bill Russell come through on the first pitch and say, see, we've changed. That's not just not going to happen. So, fast forward, uh, I have a charity that I've been working with for almost 20 years. It's called Mentoring. And we have, so far, a very successful program. We started out with the name One to One, One Mentor, One Mentee. Last year, 2012, we passed 8 million volunteers throughout the country. Was it eight or four? Four million, I'm sorry. Four million volunteers throughout the country that are one-to-one -one mentoring. And, uh, but it's not uh, just black kids. It's kids. Uh, in the Boston chapter, we've got a lot of Hispanic kids, a lot of Asian kids, a lot of black kids, a lot of white kids. Uh, the only requirement is you be a kid. And, uh, and some adult wants to spend some time helping you get started. And we have found that the adults that volunteer to be mentors end up profiting more than the kids. Because you find out on a very personal basis how you can be helpful. So you asked the Red Sox to, to, to become active? Well, no, I asked the uh, Red Sox. They had three or four owners. I said, I want one of those owners to go on the board of my charity. Not to say we support it. Go on the board. 
They said, well, don't you want a player? I said, no, I don't want a player. It's not that I don't restrict the players or not, but the owners can make policy decisions. And the owners are not likely to get traded away. <laughs> so, so the players or the Red Sox are, as far as I met and talked with them, are nice, nice bunch of young guys who are prone to be active in the community. And so I said, but it's not to insult them. That's not the point. point I want somebody from the Red Sox that can make decisions and policy. So uh, we got one of the owners to go on the board. And he's done an absolutely marvelous job. In fact, most of the people in New England think that mentoring is a Red Sox program. And I can live with that, you know, because that's the biggest voice in New England is the Red Sox. And, uh, and they went all out. That's your fault. I love this. We're going. So the Red Sox stepped up to meet your conditions and support the mentoring yes. um, foundation? Yes. Uh, what they did was they got twice a year at Fenway Park. They have step up to the plate for mentoring. And on the Green Monster, they have a banner that lists the number of people they brought into the mentoring program. And for every Red Sox game, there are four seats set aside for two mentors and two mentees that have been together for three years or more. They're the guests of the Red Sox. And they've encouraged their sponsors and their uh, uh, well, well, anyway, they encourage people that do business with them to start mentoring programs in their companies. So they've been really super. So when did somebody from the Red Sox call you up and say, we think we've met your conditions, we've tried to make a change, are you ready to throw out the first ball? I did. <laughs> How did that go? Didn't get it over the plate, though. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How long ago was that that you threw out the first pitch? Well, it must have been it was more than maybe six years ago. Six years. So after they won the World Series? Yes. Uh-huh. The first uh, time? Uh, because my late wife and I went back there a couple of times. And uh, the Red Sox did something very nice. They started a scholarship for one of the city kids in Boston and named it the Mail and Nort Russell Scholarship. And, uh, named it for Merrill. Yes. And uh, that really pleased me a lot because that was my. That was my good friend. Mm -hmm. and, and so then, how long after that was it that the city of Boston, was it the mayor who approached you about uh, the statue? Yeah, well, uh, after I got the Medal of Freedom and Obama says someday there'll be a statue in Boston for Bill Russell, and I told him I'd never forgive him for that. <laughs> Because when Tom uh, Manino first told me about the statue, I said, uh, you know, a statue sounds, sounds to me a lot like a tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> he says, why do you say that? I said, well, you know, if you really, truly believe in God, he does not need a marker to find you. So I said, I would be willing to be buried in an unmarked grave because of that. If, if you really believe in God, he doesn't need a marker to find you. He'll know exactly where you are. And so, uh, but Tom says, well, I says, and besides that, I don't need anything like that. He says, well, it's not so much for you as it is for the city. You've made a tremendous amount of 
difference in community and race relations. Because uh, my way of thinking, I've not got past the place where we're beyond race. Uh, even I ain't dead dumb. <laughs> <laughs> But that can be, if you want it to be, a healthy part of community relations. That there is a difference. But they found out that when I made decisions, it was based on competence, not on race. And that's all that anyone could ask of anybody. You said, oh. If you're going to make a decision and race becomes a part of your decision-making process, what you have to really go to is competence. And uh, like I used to always say, long ago, someone asked me, what would I think about a gay person playing the NBA? This was years and years and years ago. And I said, I have one question. Can he play? <laughs> we're okay. We're rolling again. All right. So, so when is the when is the um, statue going to be unveiled? Uh, well, after I conceded we could do it, I pretty much put it on the back burner, and so they tell me they give me. Uh, Tom says. Uh, if we do this, we're going to have you make all the key decisions. And uh, first, I looked at five different sites in Boston with the city manager to see where we're going to put it. And uh, we ended up at City Hall Plaza, which is adjacent to the Freedom Trail and near the state, old state house. And we're gonna put uh, a little, a little bigger than the alley, but it's gonna be like the Valley of Champions. And so, for all the teams that have won championship, we'll have a star lead up to the statue. And they're gonna have some of my pet phrases like, uh, "There are no such thing as other people's kids." They're all next generation Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few things like that. On the statue? No, in the on little plaques all oh, around. In the plaques, okay. Yeah. So, uh, but Tom did not have me convinced yet. And so he says, okay, we're going to set up a legacy foundation to support mentoring. And so every year we'll have fundraisers around the statue to raise money for mentoring. And uh, that's a good way to get real personal community involvement in the educational system. And uh, when you get that, you see like I saw a thing on TV the other day that in terms of literacy and all that kind of stuff, America's in the second 10, okay? Well, how are you gonna maintain a viable part of the future if you don't educate the next generation? Hmm. And uh, the only way you can beat that is start a war. Right. <laughs> You know, and so uh, I don't think wars are helpful. <laughs> you mentioned getting the Medal of Freedom from President Obama. What was that experience like? And I, I understand that he. Well, I said at the nice time, I, I think he's an extraordinary nice man, first of all, and a good person. But they asked me, is that the highest honor you ever got? And I said, just second. 
and I said, second, yeah. Second? <laughs> yeah. Well, if that's second, what was the highest honor? Well, when he was 75, my father said to me one day, you know, I'm very proud of you as my son. I'm also proud that I'm your father. And uh, this is my hero. And you, you can't top that. Not coming from the hero. But it was a good second, right? Oh yeah, it was a good strong second. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say about uh, your helping him become president? He just said that uh, it was guys like me that made it possible for him to be president. I said I don't. I said I don't see that, but thanks anyway. You know I really like him uh, on a personal basis. The first time I met him, we were dedicating the uh, start of the work on the Martin Luther King Monument in Washington, and so he walks to me. I know you. You're Karen Russell's dad. <laughs> and you know it's funny that's the same thing Bill Clinton said the first time I met him you know uh, uh, and so it's, it just feels funny being a parent and have someone say that about you and I said what about Chap Limba <laughs> <laughs> you also mentioned speaking of mentors and, and, uh, and role models that uh, you were the only basketball pallbearer for Jackie Robinson? Is that right? How did that come about? Oh, the only non-teammate. The only non-Brooklyn Dodger teammate. Right. Uh, well, when Jackie started with the Dodgers, I was 13. And uh, he was the essence of an athletic hero to us that played ball, not just baseball or football, but ball, because he was a man that played baseball. And uh, at that time, up until then, there was nobody like that. You know, there had been guys that were, had notoriety, but they were not stand-up guys. And so when Jackie died, Rachel Robinson called me and said, I want you to be a pallbearer at Jackie's funeral. Well, that's right up there with uh, a close number three, okay? And so uh, I said, of course, just tell me when and where. Not a, I said, I'm taking not a lot of kids from the projects in West Oakland get to be a Paul Bear for Jackie Robinson. And so I said, why me? She said, you were Jackie's favorite athlete. Well, as far as fans and all that kind of stuff, nobody else comes close to that. You know, Jackie was our guy as a kid. I for say that he turned around and respected me. And see, I took the attitude because of that. When I thought about it, I said, Jackie took us from point A to point B. First black guy in the major league sports, baseball. Well, when I got with the Celtics, I did not want to revisit that point A to point B. I wanted to go from point B to point C. That's why I was kind of halfway important that I coach. And uh, the guy asked me once, how important is it to you the first black coach? I said, it's not important. I said, first of all, I'm the best person for the job. 
for this particular job, and I know that. And second, it'll be important when coaches are hired and fired with no reference to race. Then it's important. So like now, coaches are, and managers are fired wholesale. <laughs> okay? And nowadays, never is there reference to race. We should speak just a little bit here toward the end, because we met, you mentioned Jackie as a role model, um, and about your relationship with some, we've talked about your teammates, but you also had some pretty celebrated rivals that you said your reaction with your, your relations with your adversaries were special because they made you play better. Um, well, that Oscar always, that... And, and Wilt and, and Elgin Baylor. Not only that, but... Uh... At that time, with the NBA, I really seriously wished that every player in the NBA could find a position where he could play his best. Because then the people that went to the NBA games would see the best players in the world playing their best. And I kicked their ass at their best. <laughs> <laughs> but that, it, in a way, didn't that indirectly lead to, to your part of your um, feud, I guess is not quite the right word, with Wilt because he didn't play in your last game and you wanted him to make you earn it, that last championship? Well, well no, you know, I talked to Wilt about that. And I looked him in the eye and I said, Wilt? I apologize for the stuff I said. That was just hubris, you know. It was my last game and I knew it. And I didn't want anything to make it less pleasant to me. And uh, the reason I said things about him that I should not have said was I was speaking to a, uh, a college group in Iowa, I think. And there was a reporter in there, mixed in with the kids. I didn't know he was a reporter, okay? And so we do this question and answer. He said, well, you never would have won that last championship if Wilt hadn't got hurt. Well, it annoyed me. Of course, when Wilt left the game, we were 17 points ahead. Uh, you know? And I went off on Wilt, and he had nothing to do with it. And so I looked him in the eye and apologized to him and said it was just hubris. I was, uh, not only that, I was wrong. But you did want him to be in the game because yeah, you got something out of the competition. Uh, well, no, well, also, as long as he's a game, we were 17 points ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to change that. <laughs> Once in one of your books here about Dr. King, I don't want. I had the same reservation about Dr. King that I had about the Vietnam War, which is that the white people in Boston liked him, so I knew something must be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a light moment, because um, there was a time when they were kind of superficial about race relations. Because yeah, well, uh, the reason I was there that was. Uh, also in Boston, at the time, was a guy named Detroit Red. I think it was Detroit Red, who later became Malcolm X. Oh. And uh, they would love to put them at opposites, you know, and uh, And so they choose the doctor. Well, I said, if these people uh, choose him, I'm going to be suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, when I always thought that, well, because I thought this way, 
It was a major problem, but there was not one the solution. And those very jars, SNCC, uh, uh, NCAACP, about five or six other uh, organizations fight the same battle, but with different approaches. And I thought it was important that they all be able to maintain. You see, because you get to a place where one organization speaks for a whole race, the race is in trouble because uh, they're smart enough to figure out how to beat that. You know, that's like, uh, I had a conversation with Nelson Mandela, and I told him how respectful I was of what he did. And one of the things he did not do, he did not disavow violence. Now, he was not going to advocate a civil war. But he said that if he'd say he turns his back on violence, all of his comrades tried to change apartheid, they would put a target on their back. And uh, so he wouldn't do that. So that there were probably a dozen or more groups in South Africa fighting apartheid. Each with their own agenda and their own style of fighting the same problem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've never put down any of those groups trying to change things. Let me ask you three sum up questions to end. First of all, the, looking back on your career and your life, do you have any major regrets as to things that you would have done differently? What's that? Do you have anything, any major regrets that you would have liked to have done differently? I don't know. Uh, philosophically, I was opposed to racism being part of the atmosphere. Uh, and I did what I thought I could do to help change it. Or at least expose it. And uh, expose it is a good first step. Yes. Uh, you can't ever help to solve a problem until you recognize it as a problem. So uh, I don't know. Uh, see, I was not your intellectual. <laughs> I just, well, you know, I don't know if there's anything I could do to change it. And how do you how do you um, look at today's NBA? Because you're you're a part of it again. They've got the award name for you. You go to the finals uh, compared to your NBA. And do you think the future of the league is still still good? Well, you know, I was watching the playoffs the other day, and there are a lot of good players, a lot of them. Like uh, when I was playing, maybe four guys in the league could shoot three-point shots. And not every team's got four guys who <laughs> can shoot three-point shots. You know, uh, the game has changed, though. Uh, it's the most evolving of all the games. And so I always say that I would never ask a player to play against ghost, past, present, or future. You know, uh, how would you have done against so and so? Well, that's a different time. You know, like the old guy asked me one time, how would you have done against Shaq? I said, first of all, you got the question backwards. <laughs> and I love that kid. I really do. Uh, I said, but you can't compare players of different eras. Because, uh, for example, for all intents and purposes, I invented the block shot. Okay? 
I'd never seen a shot blocked until I started doing it. When Shaq was four or five years old, block shots were an integral part of the game. So he starts at five, where I started at 18. Well, you can't, you can't ever compare that. You know what I mean? And uh, there are certain standards. For example, when I was playing, there was no such thing as a zone defense allowed. We were not allowed to play zone. Now everybody plays zones. There are variations on them, but they're zones. And we had contempt for teams that played zones because they had at least one or two guys that couldn't play defense. And so the zone protected them. Uh, well, now uh, the zone's an integrated part of it, and if it's played right, it can be very effective. So finally, this interview will become part of the archives of the new National Museum of African hey, American History. Taylor, yes. you gonna put me in the archive? I'm gonna put you. <laughs> I'm going in there. I'm who going are you? In there with you. <laughs> hey, who are you, Indiana Jones? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're going to be looking out to an awful lot of people. Do um, you have any advice for young people that are going to come to this museum as to how they should go about framing their choices for their life? Well, if you're fortunate enough to find something you do well, uh, approach it professionally. Find out what it's all about and how can you take what it's all about and make an improvement from, uh, from your point of view. And uh, uh, you take things from uh, a novelty to a professional. You know, things that you enjoy doing well. Well now, when I was an active as a playing basketball, First, let me get that straight. We used to be, uh, we used to travel before the jet fleets. Uh, if it's foggy, you just, you just stay there. And so you might spend all day at the airport. And so we at the airport one time, I forget where, and uh, this guy walked to me, you kind of tall. A very astute observation. Uh, you a basketball player? I said, no. So about five or six guys came up and asked the same question. You a basketball player? I said, no. So Havacek was there watching this, and he said to me, how come you say you're not a basketball player? I said, John, that's what I do. That's not what I am. I'm a man that works at professional basketball. See, the misnomer is everybody says play. Well, you long since finished playing. <laughs> you know, and if you don't know, uh, uh, the closest we came to playing was at Celtics, we had a motto. Play like children without being childish. And, uh, Is that your motto or was it Well, I, it was just in the air around there. I don't know who, who came up with it, but we took it. That uh, and uh, the way we won all those championships was we knew how to play. Now uh, that sounds odd. Everybody knows how to play. Don't well, not everybody does not have the total team concept. When I was at my best with the Celtics, I could run all our plays from all five positions. Point guard, shooting guard, small forward, big forward, post. I could run the plays from all those positions. Not that I wanted to run the plays, but if one of my friends was having a problem, I could understand it and know how to help. 
And you know where, where help comes from and how it comes. So finally, have you been um, back to Monroe any time? Uh, you talked about your mother and... Uh, no. I, I, if I go there, it'll be under duress. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like this, Taylor. I, I started my life in Monroe. And the white people in Monroe were really mean to me and my family. Still, my grandfather. I mean, not just, well, but they were actually mean. Like the one time this, uh, he's under sheriff or deputy sheriff. And my mother very proudly bought her a riding habit. You know, the little jacket and the pants with the flare and the boots. And the sheriff, other sheriff walks up to her and says, you get off the street with those outfits on. You can't dress like no white woman. What's wrong with you? If I ever see you like that again, I'm going to put you under the jail. Scared her so bad, she probably shook for two or three days. Well, I don't feel like, well, I go back to my old hometown. No, that did not make sense to me, no. you know. And so uh, I don't go to my door unless I, unless the, after my mother died, I took my boys there once and uh, I think it's the only time I've been there. You said you, were, uh, you thought you might go visit her grave sometime. You've never done What's that. What's that? Did, didn't you say you might go visit her grave sometime? Yeah, you know what? I would know how, would not know how to find it. No, no. <laughs> well, she gave you a, she gave you an awful good start. Yes, she did, and I really appreciate it. But I uh, just don't get to that part of the country anymore. All right, I think we're done. If you guys have any other questions, I think I think we're good, Bill. Thanks a lot. That's all right, Doug. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.